One afternoon, the sky above us and the sky to the side of us gathered together into a strange and terrifying pattern. So we stopped what we were doing and pointed at it. Even our power walkers and mail carriers, even our demons and sasquatches, even our own actual clowns pointed in perplexity. Holy shit, we all said. The hoses in our hands sprayed limply onto our lawns. What the fuck is that? Belted Barbara Dukowski's youngest boy. His eyes were like two plastic drink lids floating in dishwater. Also, he was 11 and a half and he already had the faint shadow of a mustache. Iggy, watch your goddamn mouth. Nearby, someone started to cry, then another and another. Iggy, meanwhile, mumbled something back at her. Boy, I'm going to smack those vows out those goddamn cuss words if you don't watch it. What we saw, we later learned, rose above sea level maybe 28,000 feet at the equator and maybe 30,000 feet at the pole. And stretching from horizon to horizon, it encapsulated our planet within the polka dotted skin of a clown. The dots were bright red and they were about twice the size of the sun and the space outside the dots was semi-translucent and white. There, was, there were wrinkles and freckles on some parts of the skin and pores and acne scars on others. Also, it was hairless, like all the hair had been waxed off, but you could still pretty much make out its goosebumps as they rose and sank across the heavens. Because maybe, we wondered, something we were doing was really exciting to it. Sometimes we thought we could see it shiver slightly, the clown skin. Rumors spread of a great meandering vein that throbbed above the Pacific Ocean. Video footage leaked, but we disputed its veracity. AI, we screamed. Deep fake, we screamed even louder until all of us undermined it. The video then disappeared beneath a windfall of new information. Bones, bones, and bones, and we left it for the worms and the beetles. Even over Bergen, any number of us witnessed several ghastly white warts. Even over Eritrea and Djibouti, crow's feet spread from the horizon. Rare islands all but lost to our governmental bodies and academic cartographers and internet search engines claim that giant eyeballs and parts of giant eyeballs were staring down at them with various looks of indifference and anger, of fear and wonder. And as the weeks passed, we began to lose contact with any number of aircraft that had been flying above it when it spontaneously came into our lives. Most of these planes had crashed and exploded onto the clown's skin, charring into blemishes that from the ground looked like tiny massive blackheads. Others had managed to land intact along the ridges of gore and fat of its sticky subcutaneous tissue while their doomed passengers opened their window shades onto a stunning new horror of their own. We were stunned ourselves. I mean, how could we not be? Except for those of us who were brain dead or in comas or grappling with dementia like our dads had once had. Or those of us who lived in caves and bunkers. Just look at what the fuck was happening. And even though we still retained our daytime per se, the sunlight could only refract through the sheer space between the polka dots, casting the sunlands in a dull white glow. Our clouds disappeared entirely or sank against the planet into banks of thick, ubiquitous fog. Our trade winds shifted direction and shifted again and again and again and again till they eventually got lost in the confusion. Our glaciers uncalved with their young. The Pentagon even launched several dozen Patriot missiles up at it from its clandestine counterterrorism outposts in the Sahara Desert. We watched it on our cellular smartphones and from the stools of our favorite dive bars and some of us on the little TVs built into our gas pumps. The clown skin shuddered upon impact. We saw all these explosions. They thundered in threes. And as the flames cleared, blood rained along the barren landforms of the undisclosed country. The Tuaregs climbed back into their ruined goatskin tents. Tanara went, put away their electric guitars and shook their heads and gestured cryptically at the heavens. Several days later, when our expeditionary forces fired again, it was thick gobbets of pus that superated along the dunes. In the aftermath of all this chest beating, the rest of NATO and the UN and ECOWAS and the AU and various international concerns signed a mutual moratorium on attacking the goddamn thing. We'll wait and see what happens, we said in our various tongues. Even our demons got in on the action. Our Sasquatches, however, were MIA. We agree, the demons said remotely via Microsoft Teams and the telepossession of Ambassador Media. They wore noisy white tracksuits and aviator sunglasses with a lens flipped up, and they stared vacantly at whatever was in front of them, the ambassadors. Their eyes spouting blood, their hands flat on their laps. We agreed pooled their eye blood atop the conference table. Into words it pooled. Generals, business tycoons, global experts, heads of state scooch back diplomatically in their chairs. Shut it down, pool the blood. But the most surprising thing we discovered was just how, just how quickly we absorbed this new phenomenon into our daily lives. No more stars or space travel, no more northern lights, no more meteor showers or satellites poking across the exosphere. 
We felt less like human beings and more like assemblages of generative fills and neurofilters. And we found ourselves caravanning south to where the refracted gloom of the sun was slightly brighter and therefore slightly more bearable. Chainsaw guts fuck played on our car stereos. One of our speakers had blown out, so we changed our phones over to mono for all the instruments to come through. We played high quality rips of our old vinyl records. Some of us somewhere had put these audio files onto the internet and the rest of us had downloaded them through Pirate Bay and other useful websites. We downloaded them a long time ago, but we still listened to them because we never made the jump to streaming services for whatever reason. We stopped sunbathing outdoors and switched over to our indoor water parks, their domes retrofitted with blazing sun-like bulbs. We grabbed colorful inner tubes from off the massive hills of colorful inner tubes and floated lazily down artificial streams. Birds and monkey sounds piped in through the plastic palms. We watched movies that featured scene after scene in the old sky. Old blue, we called it, and that seemed to help at least a little. And we continued to sink into vice and uncertainty the same way an old man sinks into a tub. People blew their cool. They blew their little weird-shaped minds out on Netflix original programming and designer drugs and silly made-up games with their cats and dogs and yoga goats. And they posted these games onto Instagram and TikTok and various Christian social media sites. They clicked and liked and shared and rated each other. They got into violent arguments in all caps and the news media reported earnestly on these arguments. Then they took the drones up to the clown skin to inspect it more closely. Some of them flew jetpacks up there. Others took deck tears rigged with big helium balloons. The clown skin was springy and taut like a tamper, but like a trampoline they told us from their cellular smartphones. But it was real skin though. We could see the earth thousands of feet below them on our own view screens. We pinch zoom on their cleavage and camel toes and semi-erect penises. We could hear their winds noisily through our own phone speakers. They sounded like cellophane being crumpled, like the chorus seeing howls of the damned. And we asked each other in the comment threads, to what organism does this belong? And why is it here? Some retrieved tissue samples with exacto knives and little smoky green vials and sold them at roadside stands along the information superhighway. Families looked out of their big living room windows at its marvelous traffic of ones and zeros, and beyond it, above the horizon, bleep, bloop, blop, the clown skin itself. They're called picture windows if you didn't know that. It's where our senior citizens can gaze out in vague patriotic stupors and wave tiny plastic flags with their liver-spotted hands. The, generation, the greatest generation, they're called, and they're still around if you can believe it. Tentacles erupted from out of the hot springs of our minds. They slapped down cinematically onto the orangish limestone that made up our surrounding memories. Air and steam fizzled and spouted. Cocker spaniels drew back, barking savagely or tugging at the hems of our flower sundresses with their teeth while we screamed and turned and fled back to our cars. And nobody went back to their day jobs, their night jobs either. I mean, what can you do about it? The answer is nothing, motherfucker. There's nothing you can do about it. Violent celebrations broke out, riots and self-flagellation and massive Scylla Caribbean mosh pits. Walls of death split the crowds. We pumped our tattooed fists of squids and flames and Sailor Jerry roses. We bobbed our odd-shaped heads. Minor Threat got back together and put out a new record. It sounded like their old shit, which was pretty rad. Only the lyrics were half-hearted and the issues they sang about really didn't matter anymore. Rap splintered even further into more indefatigable subgenres. Disney Corporation festered and bloated. Big boils grew along our new heavens, their big farty winds. And rumors drifted in from Beijing about some shipment of Sylvia Plath finger puppets, sideline novelty gifts for our abandoned bookstores that were inhaled through the warehouse ducts from a manifold of converging storm systems and disgorged several hundred miles away into the Yellow Sea. Clown skin. Our daily planners clasped in our claspers, bending up the cold spine. So many questions we needed answered, but shirked for our cocaine and our honey boo-boo chows and our stupid little fantasies and diversion. Our, motor, our motocross tailgate parties, our Castlevania speed runs, our sick VHS collections, all the stupid goddamn bullshit that we tell ourselves just to alleviate the terror we've been feeling towards oblivion, trapped in its maw. Our kids acted weirder than ever, the tides and their algorithms, weather patterns and shit, fuck if they did. Tornadoes slouched towards their barns, dust devils squatted in their ditches, lightning struck in squares and cubes, crabs exploded. The stock market crashed, it popped and locked, it shimoned it sang, it kicked out its weird gimpy leg and thrust its pelvis and danced and walked backwards. It did the moonwalk, it spun on the balls of its feet, and it did effortlessly what few stock markets could actually do shimoned. It floated on air, on your TVs, on your devices. It bit spoons with its mind, and at times when haunted seaboard houses compelled it to, it assaulted and murdered with an axe its tired, illegitimate family. Clad in brown corduroy and red flannel, its spry lesbian daughters, 
Even these spoons got in on all the action, and then on their electro skateboards, they crashed into our cactus bushes. All of our spook lights went out, all of them in America at least, from northeast Oklahoma to the ones near Marfa. Spook lights are like ghosts, maybe. They're strange little lights in the distance that nobody can explain. Our winches swoon, their bodices rip spontaneously open. We turned to our stiff liquor drinks. We pointed at you with tumblers in our hands. We slapped your ass and told you to smile more often and called you doll face. Then a battery of smart pants suited women came to displace us. Switchblade knives, bubblegum from the bubblegum store. Bitch, I'll cut you, they said. They fired the trigger buttons on the ivory handles. The blades popped out. Each blade was information and a narrative in its own right. The gum in their mouths circling about. Don't look over there, they told us, round and round. Looked over here, goddammit. We're the ones who's talking. Robo robots took over our day jobs, our night jobs too. They were basically three cardboard boxes stacked from large to small, bottom on up. Tin foil stapled to their sides. The tin foil was like actual skin and it ripped when you, grubbed, when you grabbed roughly at it. Because these robots were real from nature like the rest of us. Bleep, bleep, blop went the robots. Now, nah, fuck that shit, they actually said, warbling at us in autotune. Help me, goddammit, I'm bleeding. Tourist attractions burnt to the ground. Pets retired their owners. Pets put them to sleep. They paced and cried and smoked mentholated cigarettes out front of emergency people clinics. They nervously clicked their fingernails against their thumbnails. Our cats had thumbs. They pushed and tugged at their cuticles. Cockfights resumed. They fought with their bare fists. Roosters had fists and teeth and gold chains, baby. General mission was charged, put together by the Knights of Columbus. Ten dollars those bastards charges, no Venmo. You put out your wrist for a wristband and you pretend like everything's okay, but there's nothing okay about it. You find yourself at Tiny Bar with Steven and Betsing, hoisting pints and pretending that you're never going to die, but you are. It's all going to end. It's all terrifying. And the terror is cold and raw and it's been brining in the walk-in cooler for days. The tumbleweeds halted. You couldn't find pot anymore, which the kids were all calling something else now anyways. And they all laughed at you for being old and out of touch and mortal and dull and for using words like grass and reefer. Now you're huffing paint thinner out of potato chip bags. Now you're an anthropomorphic potato chip bag yourself and your ears go wah, wah, wah. You love your parents again. You strut in a line with anthropomorphic sodas and popcorn boxes and candy. You're an icon of movie theater concessionary commercials and you go back to the gun range. You see a pair of gray foxes cut through your parking lot to hunt for squirrels nearby in the Christian compound. The clown skin somewhat brilliant in the dull rays of the failing sun. You're breathing heavy inside your potato chip mask. Your ex takes you back and she really loves you again. Really, she does. And you turn, to her, and you turn her towards the bedroom mirror and you say to reflection, look how beautiful you are. And it's all quite strange and unexpected and amazing and wonderful. And your potato chip heart wells with unbelievable joy. And you really can turn back the clock, you discover, midway through your life. And later that night, you look up at the clown skin and you bend down on one knee. You're in the orange cone of a streetlight and you cast forth your wimpy suede back arms and you say to the cosmos, to yourself mostly, this time it's going to be different. And in some cases it is, in, in some cases it is, for the most part, really. Insane clown posse becomes prophets. They're clown rappers and impresarios of sorts, if you didn't know that. The gathering of the juggalos is absorbed into one of our minor national holidays and their fans feel suddenly vindicated. They celebrate with fat, blunt cigarettes and regional brand soda pop, and we come out sheepishly, one by one, and apologize to them for being such dicks. We're sorry for gatekeeping, we say. We're sorry for being such assholes, and they're surprisingly cool about it. They crouch beside us like boring old adults who crouch beside kids to explain life lessons or Jesus. It's okay, buddy, says one of the juggalos. It's Iggy with a nascent black mustache. Everybody makes mistakes. We're killer, we're debonair, we stand lost in front of our open fridge doors as they fill slowly with bright celestial light. We push up our eyeglasses, we puff out our soul patches, we play hot blues licks on Fender Telecasters, and we turn up our amps louder and louder and louder just to drown out all the anxiety that's radiating about us. And we're half asleep and we're barely functional, and yet we're hitting the fan switches to our air mattresses, and our partially deflated mattresses start to blow up again. We've all gotten pretty fat by now, and our added weight forces the air to escape gradually through the night. And while our air mattresses engorge beneath us like massive tumescent penises or like giant sea anemones inflating into such gargantuan sizes, not even our largest sea creatures could eat them. And while our downstairs neighbors blow their brains out on depression and holy terror, and while the buckshot blasts up through their ceilings and up through our floors and punctures our swollen air mattresses, we're just floating there, slightly drunk, slightly oblivious, our ex-ex-girlfriend snoring with gusto in other rooms, 
and we find ourselves sinking rapidly while our wimpy legs sting with metal and pieces of wood and skull bits. And that was the pu- and that was the fun part, if you can believe it. And that was also where the fun part ended. So, science and religion fought over the origin and the remedy of the clown skin. Witches quit witchcraft. Colts ensued. Our clowns exalted to the status of chieftains and royalty. Honking horns, pies in your faces. Tiny cars rolled off assembly lines. Large, prosperous families crammed inside of them. They terrorized the streets. They fired confetti cannons. The confetti was actually bits of painted scrap metal and rock salt. Some of us were hit by this, and we exploded into liquid and goo. Others were chased down by the clowns, meanwhile, and overtaken at the chained-off terminals of remote county roads. We squirmed and pleaded, bound and partly gagged. Please, we cried. Then the clowns reached behind our ears. You don't have to do this, we added. Our ears caked with sand. We were scared. We were confused. The murky sun beyond the clown skid still burned our own skin, which was now bright red, and it felt like ants were crawling all over it. Because we weren't made for this. The clowns removed their fingers from behind our ears and pulled out quarters. Then they honked our noses while we struggled against the ropes, against our loosened gags. Our wrists and ankles tore and bled, so we stopped. Please, we said. Jesus Christ, hold on a second. Then before long, the clown skin begins to rot. It starts so slowly at first that we don't even know what's happening, but we know that something's off. Only only we really can't say for sure. Then the smell of the air changes imperceptibly, then it's barely perceptible, then it's unmistakable, so we stop everything. We stop fooling ourselves because that's what we've been doing all along. It's horrible, we think. We look uncomfortable. We look like we're in pain. We have puzzled looks on our faces like we're being fucked roughly with tiny penises. We don't go outdoors anymore, not that it's much better inside. Smells fucking horrible in there too and try to cover it up with scented candles and essential oils and aerosol bathroom sprays. Then parts of the clown skin begin to collapse. The pieces are small at first, so small we can't see much beyond these new gaps. The corpse eaters among our fauna go apeshit, others not so much. Here marks a new era of mass confusion and panic, even more so than when the clown skin first appeared across our heavens. Big f- Big pieces fall the size of pickup trucks, the size of football fields. Like clouds from the olden days, they have their own peculiar shapes. Some come as dragons, others as canaries. One comes as a giant jack-o'-lantern smoking a corncob pipe. Another as a big-ass ring pop, if you can remember those at all. There's even a humanoid chunk over Muscatine, Iowa that looks like some of us look staked to the ground. Our arms and legs stretched out, our wrists and ankles bound roughly to the stakes, Nearby, another chunk falls off that looks sort of like a potato chip bag dragging an axe. It looks like Iggy wearing a strange and wonderful Halloween costume. There are smaller chunks near the giant analogs of our bound hands that look as if our fingers have been chopped off at the middle knuckles, all but the thumbs, and it looks like a number of clown skin ants are carrying them off in different directions. Probably from different colonies or something, we elaborate in our church clothes, apocalyptically from our red and white checkered picnic blankets. The same way rioters from different races and nationalities and socioeconomic backgrounds and from different neighborhoods converge upon a department store. And it all starts to make a new kind of sense. Billionaires retreat to their bunkers just outside of Concordia, Kansas. The bunkers are decommissioned SM-65 Atlas silos where once, long ago, we hid these nukes underground that we aimed at the Soviet Union and Cuba. Now they shelter billionaires pretty well and provide nice, quirky homes for them to live in. Ones that filter out the air and that store their invaluable works of art in their hillocks of variegated jewels. They drink cocktails in their gold jacuzzis that they fill with recycled water. Not much we can do about it, they tell their horrified families and staff. They tell Chrissy and Bill in their blue boiler suits clutching their mops, stop your goddamn sniveling. But nobody can stop their goddamn sniveling. I mean, how the fuck can you even ask that? Terrible noises shudder throughout their compounds, the lights flicker, silverware rattles in their trays, their Pekingese dogs yip and cower. Some of us will make it out all right, they say, and for once maybe the billionaires are right. 